Well, this is an interesting story and illustrates the power of the TCGA data. As we were looking through our own sequencing data, we noticed one or two mutations in HER2 that were occurring in cases without HER2 gene amplification. And we began to study these and found that these mutations were activating. In other words, they switched on the HER2 kinase. Well, you'd miss them by the normal testing because they don't, there isn't increased signal with immunohistochemistry and the fish test would be negative. But the, this is a sort of cryptic activation of HER2. You have to do sequencing to find these things. And interestingly, working closely with the TCGA, I was sitting in a meeting uh, last March, and they announced, uh, the analysts announced they'd found another seven HER2 mutations. So then we studied uh, the data coming out of other people's sequencing efforts and ended up with about 25, which we reported in Cancer Discovery uh, the first part of this year. And now we have a clinical trial Interestingly, uh, not with the drugs you'd expect. You'd expect that we'd be studying trastuzumab or you'd expect we'd be studying lapatinib, but in fact, the careful molecular pharmacology indicated the best drug would be a drug called neuratinib, which is a suicide inhibitor of HER2. So instead of binding HER2 and then the drug having a reversible binding, which is how lapatinib works, these drugs bind to HER2 in a covalent way and inactivate the enzyme. And for whatever reason, in comparative studies, neuratinib uh, looked to be the best drug against, uh, broadly against all the mutants we were studying. Working with the pharmaceutical company involved, we're now opening sites throughout the United States. And interestingly, uh, and, and this is a little uh, nice trick with next-gen sequencing, we started off by doing screening with Sanger sequencing, but it's insensitive and, li and, and laborious. And I said to my next-gen sequencing people, look, I don't want 150 genes on one patient. I need 150 uh, patients analyzed for one gene. So now we use the next-gen sequencing in a multiplex fashion so that when you run the sequencing reaction, you can run 40 or 50 patients in parallel and screen lots of patients for this mutation that's occurring at about a maybe two, three, four percent prevalence. So of it's course. a rare mutation. But the point about breast cancer is so common that just a few percent can translate into thousands of patients. And the incidence of chronic myeloid leukemia is about 4,000 patients a year, and I guess HER2 mutant breast cancer could be in that ballpark. So in, from that perspective, it's not that rare in terms of the diseases that we regularly treat with targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Well, it looks like most of them would be responsive to neuratinib. So that's the nice thing about it. Only some of them look responsive to lapatinib. So what this illustrates is that when you, you have to functionalize the TCGA data, you have to do careful molecular pharmacology, and it, that increases your chance that you'll end up with a positive clinical trial. Well, interestingly, uh, it didn't. <laughs> Let me explain to you uh, about this. Uh, and we did some uh, uh, reporting of this uh, at AACR. Uh, we've been looking at patients with advanced ER-positive breast cancer that had developed hormone refractory characteristics. In other words, they'd been treated with various endocrine dr drugs that had stopped working. And our investigation style was to grab these tumors and make them grow in mice so we could study them. And we found in one of these, there's actually an estrogen receptor translocation where the ER um, was, was spliced into another gene from a different chromosome. And this this, uh, this uh, construct would be resistant to all endocrine therapies. So we didn't see that kind of thing in the TCGA data. So what I'm beginning to think is that in metastatic breast cancer, ER is becoming mutant. And interestingly, there was also some recent reports from a clinical trial called Bolero 2, where they did some sequencing of metastatic breast cancer samples. And, and there's found a, a, a additional point mutations in ER around the ligand binding domain that allow the estrogen receptor to function in a hormone-independent manner. And again, those mutations are not seen in the primary breast cancers that were sequenced by TCGA. And the, so the point I want to make is we need another cancer genome atlas, not of primary breast cancers, but of resistant metastatic breast cancers, because we can understand what the genomic changes are that generate resistance.
So in the case of ER, the tumors evolved in a bath of estrogen, so they didn't bother to mutate their estrogen receptor. But then we took those patients and took their estrogen away, and what we're beginning to suspect is the ER becomes mutant as the tumor's ability, ability to cope with the low estrogen levels drives the accumulation of mutations in the estrogen receptor itself. Well, I think what you'll see in the next year, two years, is a lot of sequencing of metastatic breast cancer, and from that, some new thinking about resistance. And once you've understood resistance, we'll be able to develop the appropriate pharmacology to prevent it. Quite radical thought, really. But what might we do in the clinic if this estrogen receptor mutation story is real? Well, interestingly, it might tell you what to do with the patient. So, for example, if this translocation mechanism is something that becomes, is clearly prevalent and worthwhile looking for, well, maybe you would look for it because no endocrine therapy would work in the presence of one of these translocated estrogen receptors. You choose some chemotherapy or some other type of drug because you don't want the patient to be on an ineffective treatment. So that's the power of prediction, in this case, predicting resistance, so you can give the patient something else and not bother about second or third line endocrine therapy if they've already developed this kind of resistance mechanism. The, the difficult thing to do is to get clinicians to biopsy metastatic disease and make sure you've got a genotype of the metastatic tumor at the time you want to make a treatment decision. We think we can go back to the primary and sequence that, and that'll tell us what to do with the patient but it won't tell us about the acquired resistance mutations. This is a story that we see in CML all the time, right? So they, they, you, treat, you treat with uh, imatinib, they develop resistance, and you can treat with a second drug that targets the resistant mutation. Lots of cooperation, the willingness to biopsy metastatic breast cancer, get those samples into discovery pipelines, and then we can translate that into useful tools for the practicing clinician. Well, we're in this fantastic new world. Uh, it's, for a while, it's going to be chaotic because we don't know what all the information means. But I think what we'll be finding, we, there'll be very nice new tools to personalize therapy, maybe just starting with our first two favorite genes, ER and HER2, with additional tools related to the somatic genetics of those two genes, and then moving on into many other of the very interesting targets that we can, uh, we've fingered in these large uh, genome atlas projects.